So for who has not been present up till now, I'd like to introduce to you Mrs. Catherine Ducoma norge from Philadelphia in the US of A, Swiss born, married from 1987 up till his death in 2007 with Ivan Bezermeni norge And as I may add, she is, for many reasons, a formidable, formidable connoisseur, so a formidable kenner, a formidable connoisseur, <laughs> and practitioner of the contextual approach. You worked as a psychiatrist, you had your own practice of family therapy, you still are teaching on contextual therapy, especially abroad next month. Mind you, she's going to Switzerland, to France, to Oslo, and even to Mongolia to teach. That is quite impressive. And you also have a huge experience as a supervisor. And your CV is really most impressive. I had no idea. This week, here in the conference, we have already experienced a bit of your fast and very to the point comments here during the conference in the workshops for which we are very grateful and I'm glad that now you get this stage to tell and to teach us more. Now I myself am a minister in a reformed church nowadays in a church in Amsterdam and I've had had my contextual trainings on the side and since 2014, um, Catherine, as I and many others in this room may call you, um, we have known each other since 2014. And there's more to tell about this, but I will skip that because it's better to lose our t not to lose our time and to listen to Catherine. <coughs> um, we all know what's at stake in this conference, the future of good therapy in general, but especially the future of good contextual therapy. Now here's what we're going to do. Um, Catherine and I have prepared the interview. I came up with questions, she came up with answers, I came up with questions, she came up with answers, and we focused on three topics. The first one is what has led Catherine herself to the thoughts and the work of Ivan Buzarmini Norj? How did it contribute to your work? What is his legacy for you as a therapist and a teacher? And then the two main conferences, uh, themes of this conference, um, the merging or integrating therapies, what can you say about that? And the need for proper research. Now besides from this, we'd like you to participate in this interview. Therefore, make it a more relational event and you get your chance to ask a question and hear your comment. Um, so it means we will start with the interview and then after a, 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 few, a few minutes, we will, or, or a little bit more minutes, we will start, <laughs> uh, stop and I'll give you the floor for your cues and your A's. Questions and answers. Don't be shy. I've asked many questions while preparing this interview of which I thought, oh boy, I'm showing again my ignorance, but you always found exactly out what I was speaking about and you helped me to understand things more clearly. So I wish you have the same experience as I have. Um, okay, and please be all brief. Then we have... Uh, time to go back and forth. And Case, the chairperson of this day, will uh, uh, go around <laughs> with the mic, but you just can ask your questions either in English or in Dutch. Uh, Case will repeat the, your questions through the microphone and summarize it if necessary. And then um, we go to Catherine. So don't wait for the microphone. Okay, let's start. Hello. <laughs> hey. uh, so, please tell us um, about what led to um, the work and the thinking of 
uh, Ivan Bizerman in Notch. Uh, we call him Notch, as we know. <laughs> you call him Ivan. That's the way. That's the way. So please. Okay, but before I start, I just really want to thank the organizers and you. I mean, you have spent a lot of time in preparing this interview. We have thank worked you. together for a while now. And I am very impressed about these two uh, first days of the conference. So I want to thank the organizers for putting together the conference, for inviting me, and you for your patience with me. <laughs> She's the most patient. I can recommend her as a very patient person. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as the question, you know, uh, the uh, Gretika is a bit too optimistic because there's really only 45 minutes for the total product. So we have to see how much realistic yeah. this interaction is or not. Sure. Don't feel frustrated if, uh, if you cannot send to ask the question here. I'm very happy to discuss it later in the day with you. We will just do a little bit of that as we can do. And these are the two moderators, so I don't have the worry of saying, shut up. <laughs> Say I <do>. will. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, welcome again to this. So to answer now to your question. So to, uh, to understand what happens that brought me uh, to uh, Ivan's work, uh, it's also first to understand what brought me to medicine and psychiatry. And that was a little bit of a detoured path for me because my main interest for a long time was in uh, history, archaeology, geography. You see it from my traveling schedule, I don't mind traveling at all. So uh, for me, it was a, uh, there were some life circumstances at the time that led me to finally enter the medical school, but with a little bit of ambivalence. So for two years, actually, in the third and fourth year of medical school, I also studied Lettres in uh, Geneva University, history of religion, history of science, history of psych, uh, and then actually wrote my, my medical dissertation uh, in history of psychiatry, history of psychotherapy. So in some ways, uh, when I started to realize that this was you know, too much craziness to keep two fields of study at the same time, it didn't really work, so I settled for medicine, but then with the choice of psychiatry as a sort of history of people, if you can say that. So once I got into psychiatry and started my... So Ivan had a very different path because for him, he had an encounter with a psychotic patient, a psychotic man in the village where he spent his vacations. It really impressed him very much as a teenager, and that was immediately the motivation for him for... Uh, studying medicine and become a psychiatrist. So the paths were quite different. And so for me, eventually I go to psychiatry and then uh, also during these early years of my studies, I became interested in Buddhism, specifically in Tibetan Buddhism. And after my first year of internship in general medicine, I went to Dharamsala, India to be in contact with uh, Tibetan Buddhism there, the Dalai Lama lives there. And so circumstances work as a substitute, very briefly substitute doctor for the Tibetan children village. I got to work for Dalai Lama's sister. She was my boss. And then, so when I returned to uh, Switzerland after this short period in India to start psychiatric training, it became difficult for me because I needed to find some kind of bridge between my main interest in Buddhism and regular psychiatry, which at that time was very much oriented to psychoanalysis. On the other end, that was the beginning of family therapy, and I also needed to get some training in family therapy. So our team at the hospital and department where I was trained in psychiatry, we went to one of the very first uh, conference on family therapy, which took place in Zurich in 1978. So if you think I'm already a professional in 1978, it means that I am also part of the older uh, members of this audience today. <laughs> you have to make the calculation, it's pretty easy. So uh, there I met Ivan for the first time and uh, he was presenting on the dialectic theory of the personality and spoke about the paradox of autonomy, that autonomy results from relating, not from cut off, and all these elements that later led him to uh, the ontic dimension, dimension five that he announced decades later, because this was eight, 1978, he announced the fifth dimension, 2000. But for me, it's very interesting, uh, Gretike asked me if I met him at the time or talked to him at the time. 
I don't have really memory of any interaction, maybe just leaving the room, thank you very much, but you know, who is a young person thanking a main, very famous teacher very much for what he says, a little bit ridiculous. So I don't think maybe I even did that. But I remember this huge impression for me that this was compatible with the notion view, a Buddhist view of interdependence. So here I felt I felt the bridge between my, the, the teaching of Buddhism in terms of interdependence and Ivan's view of autonomy as resulting from relationships. So suddenly I had a, a kind of opened the paths for me because his view were quite accepted. He was not a psychoanalyst, but he was quite respected in the, by my teachers. So suddenly there was a path that opened for me that maybe I found this bridge and I am on a place where I can uh, navigate this direction. So that's maybe you understand that 40 years later to the date, quasi, that I'm still passionate about his area of his work, that I'm still, uh, of course, teaching on Dimension 5, writing on Dimension 5, and, you know, and that's maybe a difference between me and other te most teachers who stick to this four-dimensional model. Hmm. Can, you, can you comment a little bit more on that? Uh, I don't know if it's a moment right now or, yeah, maybe, that somehow, uh, you know, one thing that I think people forget about the advantage of introducing dimension five as a formal dimension. Of course, in relationship, I want to remind us very importantly, dimensions means that a situation as many dimensions. Like if I take the GPS to come to this conference, I have the uh, dimension of uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, if I go to the mountain, I have the dimension of altitude on top of it. So when we talk about relations, all these dimensions exist at the same time. So it's a question of separating that, unfolding them. As you talk to somebody, you already are in the five dimensions. But the question from a didactical po uh, point, to unfold it separately or not separately. And most teachers don't separate five and four. And I think didactically is much easier to separate it. And one important thing about research, talking about research. Very interestingly, the very good uh, research on the efficiency of psychotherapy and what school is good or not good, at the end boils down to three things, that what is helping is the consistent of the therapist, coherence of the therapist, the optimism of the therapist, of course, if you receive families and you say, oh, you're so messed up, I cannot do anything for you, it's not going to help. On the other end, the third point is the presence of the therapist. And that part of the therapist as the non-self to the self of the client is part of the healing process. Hmm. So if you use dimension five as separate from dimension four, then you are more evidencing this part of therapy that is very crucial for healing and that is common to pretty much all approaches. Hmm. You know, you can be a dumb stu student saying something stupid, but if you are really present to the other, you might be as helpful as a very senior therapist because the presence is something that is important. So this is why I'm really <coughs> insisting on not forgetting about Dimension 5 hmm. and possibly making more effort to make a place for Dimension 5 in the writings, in the research, and in the teaching. Hmm. So Lausanne in 1978 was the first time... Zurich. 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 Zurich in 1978 was the first time that you... Um, encountered um, Ivan Bezermeni Noitz and about the dialectic of the self. Now, can you say what is the, real, the first time that you really met and spoke with him? Well, that was two years later. At that time, uh, I was still in that same department, finishing my training as a psychiatrist, and we had started to see families, and he was invited to the very first family therapy uh, training program in Lausanne that opened in 1979. So I was in the midst of my training when family therapy was formally introduced in terms of training program. But th that I added, I didn't tell you before. As a woman and too young, my male bosses had to go first to the training. So I was not accepted to the training, but they didn't have a family to present to Ivan. So they begged me, could you bring the family you're seeing to, see, to meet a professor for a consultation? You know, the same type of consultation you have here in Holland. 
same, same process, you know. So I bring the family, Ivan is impressed that this young person who is not part of the program is kind of saving the day by bringing the family. And he asks my name and I introduce to him that I'm formally. And uh, I say I'm Catherine Ducuma and he writes my name, chuk, chuk, chuk. And I say, do you mind if I can spell it for you? He said, no need. My, f my brother studied French in the Ducuma family in Neuchâtel. <laughs> so that was my first contact with Ivan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then I presented the family and then what is very important is that for me, so the story of this family I think is helpful a little bit to see what was so important yeah. for me. Okay, short. It's very short. Yeah. So what happened is that I was seeing a young woman. She was married. She had two kids. Her parents had been recently divorced and she felt she could not feel herself as a mother. She was absolutely fine, you know, she didn't do any abuse, any neglect, but internally she didn't feel herself as a mother. And one track we followed as a psychiatric, uh, psychoanalytically oriented training was that it had to do with her father dating a woman of her age, young woman, so that it sort of reactivated Oedipus complex and that was the deal that we have to work with, that to understand that transference and help her to mm. get out of this child, uh, daughter transference to the father to become a wi wife and mother. mother. Mm. Didn't work. At some point we got stuck. That was the first time I saw the family once or twice to sort of figure it out. And that's when we meet Ivan. We knew the family history, but we didn't work with it. In fact, her own mother was of a Jewish back, uh, family from France, who had been decimated by Holocaust. She fled to Switzerland, married this Swiss guy, raised the family as Protestant. And uh, in some ways, when her husband abandons her, then all the fact that now she has betrayed her family of origin to marry a, a Protestant guy, and the guy is wet, gone, so that she was depressed, and the daughter's position that she didn't function as a mother gave her a job. And that's what kind of Ivan mm. sort of untangled mm. and immediately also talked about this Jewish story that in some ways she feels guilty that she didn't pursue the, the tradition, even guilt, survivor guilt. But he said to her, if you don't marry this man, then you, you don't have a family. You may have died there in France. So in some ways, by kind of betraying the family, mm. in fact, you give a family to your deceased parents. So that was really also teaching about the mandate for posterity, that what you do that may not be following the rules of the past, but gives a chance to the future is really the resource. Mm. So this is really what I learned at that mm. time. Mm. So um, one more sentence that I can, s I always say that, that I got married to contextual mm -hmm. therapy almost 10 years before I married the boss. Right. <laughs> And it was a sort of a conversion for you, yeah, that conversion, conference? Yes, how I you, mean, how yeah, it's you no, know, it was suddenly deploying the situation from a totally different mm. angle that mm. nobody had really, we knew we had to see the family, but we didn't know what to do with that. Right. We had the information, yeah. but we didn't use it. Right. So that was really a sort of a conversion, that's mm. correct. Okay. Now, so far so good, thank you. Is there someone who likes to ask a question? Do you recognize something? Um, yeah. Do you like to have some more information? Um, Sorry? Mea, we'll put her question in Dutch. Um, ik zou het heel prettig vinden om wat specifieker te horen uh, wat u onder de vijfde dimensie verstaat. Oh ja. Oh, may that we don't. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so you translate it in English? Yes, yes please. Oh, okay. Sure. This is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, what you consider to be the fifth dimension. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. But. So here I'm very sorry, but that's part yeah. of teaching on contextual therapy that I cannot really engage in. <laughs> but basically it is related to this what Ivan described as ontic dependence, which he published about in 1965, I remind the people. And so meaning that the self depends on the other to establish itself as a self, as a sort of uh, figure ground, if I can say somewhat contrast, if you want to say, it's a little bit 
a little bit too short, but that's something like this. And so that becomes a dimension of human relating. Hmm. That's what I would summarize the best I can. <laughs> Yesterday we talked about this. If they ask questions about dimension five, that will take, uh, if you really want to go into it, it will take so much um, <laughs> time because it's so interesting. In, but, <laughs> so, right. thank you. Thank you, but thank you for the question. It's a very, very valid question, obviously. Yes, of course. So, I don't know, we'll probably go to this little part. So, uh, maybe I can ask something. Uh, we are curious about... Oh. No, <laughs> you can talk. Yeah, okay. We are curious about, so why I'm going to call you, uh, okay. the so the fifth dimension, and why not the zero one, because it's... So that's the same sort of question. Tell okay, more about I mean, the this is very easy to, I mean, but it's, uh, it's okay, I, I, it's on contextual therapy, which is not, but it's fine, okay. So, basically, that's very simple. Very, very simple. Oh, uh, case will repeat the question. Repeat oh, uh, in, in uh, Dutch. Fred asked uh, why we uh, shouldn't call the fifth dimension zero, uh, the zero dimension zero, yeah. because it's fundamental for the whole thinking of Rosemary Dutch. So, zero is not a good number because it means it doesn't exist, so forget about that one. So then, uh, the problem is that he really, why that fourth dimension is very easy to understand. Because at the time when he developed his approach, there were already three dimensions in the biopsychosocial model, which is dimension one, two, and three. And it was there already. So the only position would be fourth, and then you have the choice between one and two and three, you don't want to change because it's preceding dimension four as a, a model which was already in place in classic, in uh, American psychiatry of the days. Hmm. So then you have only option five or option zero, so then option five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I do believe we have to go to the merging because the time no, no, is no, no, really no, I flying. Am not, uh, no, the I time am is not. Okay, I'm not. So I just I, Greta interrupted me one uh, not too soon before yes, the one question, Sorry. which is now I want to answer this. So I, I'll take over a little tiny bit, which is the legacy for me of Ivan's work. Okay, which we have sto we have interrupted here, which really is that for the all the time after that. I really learned to think about the importance of giving. I worked with uh, conduct disorder teenagers for all my, my career, who are considered as incapable of justice, incapable of giving, and that notion that even people with conduct disorder that we look at as ruthless takers, you know, that, that uh, they don't care about justice, they don't care about people, that if we can reach them through seeing them as hurt givers, then we have a resource that is enormously important and that also handicapped children, for instance, are, they receive a lot from everybody, they are dismissed as givers. So I just want to finish this sentence that this, not so much the, uh, the ontic dimension was important at the beginning for me as a path towards Ivan, but I think from all of his work, the importance of seeing people as givers Hmm. not dismissing them as givers, giving them avenue to give. Uh, that has been the most, uh, the thread of his legacy mm -hmm. to this day today. That's what okay. I wanted to add. Yeah, okay. Very good, so. very interesting and necessary. It's about the time that yes. is concerning. <laughs> so let's go to the first issue of the, con of the, 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 the topic that we would like also talk about is the merging or integrative approach of contextual therapy. What do you have to say about that? Mm -hmm. So in some ways there are different points here. One point is about contextual therapy itself. How do you navigate those four, uh, five dimensions? You know, if I said before, in a clinical situation, you are finding those five dimensions. They are the biological element of the, the, of the situation, the psychological element, the transactional, classical systemic elements, relational ethic elements, and that sort of self-other de delineation element. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the question for even anybody in the clinical work or in social work when you meet a situation that you have to evaluate the situation, you have to decide in what dimension to operate. 
And that's all that is there in contextual therapy. If you say that contextual therapy is an integrative approach of the five dimension, then do you operate as a psychiatrist prescribing medicine? Do you operate as a psychoanalyst and making a psychoanalytical interpretation? Mm -hmm. Do you uh, operate as a strategic systemic therapist reorganizing communication? You sit here, you sit there. Mm -hmm. Or do you talk about multidirected partiality to bring in the injustices on one side, how it affects the other side, the giving, the receiving? So indeed, already as a contextual therapist, you have to think, can I really live within the dimension of relational ethic and sit on my chair mm. as the agent of multidirected partiality as a strategy, as a goal, mm. or can I also have another hat? Mm. And I think, I, that's why I start with contextual therapy, already is there for me as a, a head of the psychi prescribing psychiatrist and contextual therapist. Maybe in pastoral counseling, uh, do the head of the contextual therapist and the head, head. of a head, you know, head. and the head of the, uh, what you say, spiritual advisor, for instance. Mm. So these are two heads, or if you are coming from infant psychology, how much you do a psychological interpretation of a situation versus shutting, the, shutting up and be an agent of multidirected partiality. So this problem inside contextual therapy is the same with merging contextual therapy with other approaches. Because then it means really, I think, merging work in relational ethics with the resources of different uh, approaches, like uh, what you call it, um, for instance, uh, um, psychoanalytically ap and in, uh, approach of family therapy, or role playing, or um, this kind of uh, play therapy, all that kind of things. Mm. So in those people who use contextual therapy, meaning work with relational ethic within their own approaches, then it is also two heads like within contextual therapy. So in summary about mm. it, I think that the question is not, can it be done? Is it good? Is it bad? Mm. It is a cost effectiveness analysis. Mm. Does working in more than one dimension Mm. or with more than one approach, mm. is improving the treatment mm. or is it confusing the clients? Mm -hmm. And somehow, you know, what I'm saying sometimes, one cannot play chess with the rule of chess game and then play a checker at the same time because then the person across would know, do I move my pieces as a <laughs> rules of, uh, of uh, uh, chess or as a rule of checker? Mm. So this is this responsibility of the therapist to figure out when I mix or merge different ways, do I confuse my therapist or do I bring more resources and what does it do to my activity as a therapist to wear more, more, more than one hat? Mm -hmm. That really would be for me the question. Mm -hmm. So there's not really an answer as much as it is a way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a good, good Maybe idea that's, for that's a where question? I was, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's fine to just take questions. a few, few seconds about that one, if it makes any sense to you. <laughs> My question is, uh, you told us that you come from the Buddhism, that is your convention, that is very important, and you were looking for how to can, can integrate it in your work. What is the, 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 Yes, I can answer this very easily. Oh, sorry. You repeat the question. You're asking when you so combining approaches. The question: What will be the surplus for the contextual approach itself? Did I understand that? No, no, for my work, I think for my work. Yeah. It's a very easy answer that somehow, in many ways, I kept saying separate. I am totally not in the movement of mindfulness meditations and these kind of things, which basically is geared to individuals. You know, it's an individual process, that mindfulness meditation. It has not much to do, actually, with relational therapy. And it's a huge challenge that Buddhism is not relational. Buddhism, you fix your shoes, you don't fix the road. So that is a problem of integrating Buddhism w with relational therapies. It's a, it's a challenge. On the other hand, how it affects me, I had a teacher, I said, I, I'm so mixed up. I did so many things in Buddhism. 
many courses, many teachers, what do I do? Is it no need to worry, practice patience. And I think that part has been helping me. You know, working with very difficult teenagers and really practicing patience in therapy. Uh, Yap has mentioned about also abstinence, you know. The, the practice of therapeutic abstinence that you don't jump mm -hmm. to any kind of signal that the family says that because somebody makes like this with the feet, you have to talk to them immediately. Uh, so this discipline, I think, was helped by the Buddhist practice. Hmm? One more. Tatiana? Um, oh, my. Isn't that uh, also the case for the people between them, not only for the therapists, that learning patience, abstinence, not jumping over the other and so on is... Uh, very important thing to be relational. Yes. And that's so mindfulness and Buddhism and so on, that individual uh, approaches can help very much to relate. Mm. relate. Mm. Yes. yes. Sorry, to repeat it. The question is yeah. uh, from how individual approaches can add to relational ethical approach. For, for uh, as a Clients. as a condition, the so basically, it's very uh, pretty straight and simple. That's dimension two. That's a relation. It's a resource in dimension two. That obviously there are many resources in dimension two. You know, cognitive therapy is a resource in dimension two that can be very helpful. That people become aware of some things from their life, etc. But the question was about my activity as a contextual therapist. Mm. And there, as a contextual therapist, when I work with multidirected partiality, there I use Buddhism as my own patience, not using Buddhism to sort of talk about suffering and say, look, maybe you're, you know, the, this, the, you know, uh, your husband is a bad guy, but I'm sure that you had a better one in a prior reincarnation or something yeah. like this, you know. So what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying, I am very abstinent not to show off my Buddhist con uh, con understanding of reality or interdependence within the treatment. That's what I wanted to say. I think this is it for now, Mer about merging or we can talk later, but we need to go on uh, to the um, last question, which is about research. Now, um, what can you tell us about Norge himself, uh, his, his research? What did he do? For, first, he was a biochemist, worked as a, did research as a biochemist, and later he did research as a family therapist. So, just a little bit for precision, so Ivan really started medicine to become a psychiatrist to help people with yep. psychosis. And he wrote in a notebook that he wanted to, write, to use for writing his uh, autobiography. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he was too sick to do that, but on the road book, notebook he made, he wrote, uh, uh, Ivan Bezomeninaj, born in Budapest in Hungary in 1920, migrated to Chicago, like he says that 48 to 50, I corrected somebody, I mean he arrived in Chicago in 50, for international justice and scientific hope for a cure for schizophrenia. So that's the scientific part, and the next sentence, for many abandoned patients. Mm -hmm. And so his notion, when he put the two together, is that mental illness is an injustice for two reasons. One is by comparison with people who are not sick. And second reason, because of the ostracism, of the prejudice against people with mental illness, specifically in those days, people with schizophrenia in the village, the villager would actually mock them and, and even maybe throw stone at them or really bad treatment of these people. So in that sense, that was two uh, motivation uh, for research is one is to find a cure, and one is to repair an injustice. So during his, medic his uh, training as a psychiatrist, he studied studies of physics and biochemistry, formal physics and biochemistry, in addition, but didn't finish his studies because uh, for it was when he left, he didn't have a doctoral degree in physics or something, or master's. So when he arrived in America, they, he could not use that as a start. You know, he would have had to start from scratch. 
So he did, decided that he didn't want to do that, but mm. he started to work in the labs. And he did six years, I don't want to go into it, it can be read in several articles what kind of research he did on really finding biological differences between people with schizophrenia and uh, normal controls to make an evidence of where could be this difference and then try to identify markers. Mm -hmm. What I just want to say about it is that his work was so sophisticated in the biochemy uh, methods mm -hmm. that his work was actually published in journals of biochemistry, not in psychiatry, in fact. Mm -hmm. And he, were, he was also in contact with very prominent physicists of the day. Uh, his professors were very known astrophysicists, were friends of uh, John von Neumann. His lab director was one of the founders of cybernetics, so he, um, uh, Ryan McCulloch. So he was really in an atmosphere of high sciences. But when at some point he got discouraged, he thought that what he had found was an artifact of the client's diet, of the psychotic people's diet, that they were eating too much sugar and that sign of prediabetes, that the control had normal food and so that the marker was an artifact. And then he said, Science is not enough, uh, developed. Uh, it could take 50 more years to be really at the place when one mm -hmm. can get good research. Mm -hmm. I go back to clinical. Mm -hmm. And that's when he accepted the job at mm -hmm. the uh, director of uh, research unit on schizophrenia mm -hmm. at uh, Eastern Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Psychiatric Hospital in uh, Philadelphia, Psychiatric mm -hmm. Institute mm -hmm. in uh, Philadelphia. And so what do you think, what did he take from that experience as a researcher to the uh, research of family therapy? So what I can understand from my watching him and some discussions that, you know, in that biological research, I say he had the, you know, methodology of controls of, of uh, uh, hard data, you know, measure, measurements. Mm -hmm. And so in the fam family therapy field, first of all, he discovered family therapy. So. You know, you cannot research family therapy until you invent it, mm. which is the first step. Yeah. So, first of all, was really to observe families and to understand what was happening in families that was different from what was happening between people, like, for instance, the patient and the staff. Mm. That was the okay. first step. Mm. And then build up hypotheses and then work on this hypothesis. Is that making sense? And so his methodology was really the taping. It was very, very early people of taping in uh, the old reel-to-reel -reel machines. Mm. Then video taping, you mean? Vid uh, audio, audio. There audio was no taping. video came much later. So then later video, and then uh, very detailed uh, analysis of microanalysis of videos with uh, himself then the staff, then discussion, what do you see, what do I see, dialogues. Mm. Also, he used the one-way mirror very early, not for this sort of uh, reflecting team as it's done now where mm. one team says outside and one team inside and then they talk about therapy, but as observer of the therapy process. So I would say all his life, extremely detailed process analysis based on documents. All right. And what about a therapeutic moment? Well, so uh, what is coming from that is that somehow the, diff the problem was he was really trying to see what helps, hmm. what is the therapeutic moment, what is the moment of changes, obviously. And that's where he was really all his life trying to see what is happening mm -hmm. and, and how to refine more and more what is happening to the place of realizing that the therapeutic moment is this moment when one gains from giving and the other one gains from receiving, mm. or that is a uh, no, moment of earning of constructive entitlement in contextual therapy language. Mm. So this was really the most um, important for him. And one of the problem for that is that somehow, as he was so fascinating by refining his method, by improving his method, by discovering new mm. elements. Mm. He did not publish almost at all on mm. hard data of how things change, and you do this intervention, and this is the result. As Aaron Beck did. So that's what I'm coming to you. You bring the word of Aaron Beck. You're cheating because you, are, you already know my answers. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I know we have three more minutes. Okay, so the answer is indeed 
Aaron Beck, uh, who was also a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, people forget completely that he was a psychoanalyst, was the founder of uh, cognitive therapy, the behavioral, co be, uh, behavioral cognitive therapy, or the other way of examining dyslexic, so whichever you understand that. Uh, there he published very, very early. So he spent much less time to sort of think and elaborate, but rather than do and measure. And I think that is really one of the questions why this approach is so much more fa uh, known in a way or, mm -hmm. or uh, publicized than contextual therapy because from the beginning on, like 40 years before, that school constantly focused on publishing results and contextual therapy has done very little in that and that's actually the purpose of this conference is to get going much more in that direction, much less in reflecting about the effectiveness but measuring and documenting and publishing. Mm. And so to me this is really the, the message for now that it is the next step. So the, the whole question, can it be done, can one manualize contextual therapy or not, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent can one get some guidelines as to this other list of intervention and what intervention works or doesn't work. So there are people who are very much in, in against manualizing contextual therapy, mm -hmm. saying that it is a humanistic approach, you cannot uh, manualize human relationships. And on the other hand, there are schools like uh, that have manualized, for instance, the dialectic uh, behavioral therapy of uh, Marsha Lilians in America, which is very much manualized. So this is a conversation for people at the conference in general. I don't have an answer to that, mm. but these are the issues I think that are the most important. Mm. So I just want to finish with one point here mm. that one of my concern is for research and for being a sort of more fair ground with other approaches by having more research, more documentation to the effectiveness of contextual therapy in, in the world of you know, therapy in general, uh, more visibility. But the other part which is very, very important is also that not to lose the part about the importance of relation therapy. And even with the co uh, comment to, uh, about mindfulness use, that somehow the, the, it's m very, very easy to fall back on dimension two. Con uh, behavioral therapy falls back on dimension two, mindfulness meditation falls back in dimension two, and how to really keep the handles on dimension four but not just relational, I think just relational therapy in general. Mm. So this would be really my message that the, the pull towards go back to going back to individual, ther individual th uh, I'd say not individual therapy as such, I'm talking dimension two, the psychology, and really keeping the courage to stay within uh, the work within relationships is my message. Well, I think that's a very clear and uh, well-spoken message. Thank you very much. And now you know, you understand why we should be continuing this for <laughs> far longer. But this is it. Uh, let's give her a big applause. Thank you so much for everything that you can contribute. Thank you. Well, no. Thank you for